the network. Hey everybody, it's Sean and welcome to Music News That Matters. We're on the first of every month. We help you sift through the noise to bring you the most important industry news. Hey guys, it's Josh here. We know there's so much information out there, but we're going to try our best to bring you all the topics that matter. Today we're discussing trends to watch in 2020, a podcast threatening the growth of the music industry, and always the weird and wonderful world of TikTok. And before we get started, since these videos are only once a month, make sure you sign up to our newsletter in the description below to get notified of the latest news and why it matters to you between episodes. And also make sure you hit that notification bell so you can get notified when we upload videos with information like this for you. And for the first time, this will be available on all audio streaming platforms. We know you guys have been commenting saying, can this be on Spotify or Apple Music? And it will be from now on. All This episode and all future episodes will be available everywhere. Awesome. I love it. I love it, man. It's been a long time coming. and It's yes, about it's, time, yeah. It is about time. We're, we're here. We hear you guys. We hear your feedback. And we have a lot of awesome topics. So, Josh, let's get into it, man. Yeah, so first of all, we've got an article from Sync Tank. And it's a... Some music industry analysts have done their predictions for trends to watch in 2020 in the music industry. We'll put a link in the description for that. Um, so a few of them have had their say, and we've picked out some of those interesting points from it to debate. And I think we'll start with the idea that the, the major tech platforms are going to become powerhouses. So the idea is that music is going to become more of a, not a separate subscription, but part of a larger sort of like package, as it were. So we've seen before, like uh, phone companies might offer Apple, for example, have Apple TV, they'll have Apple Music, News Plus, they're all being bundled together. And that's quite, that's not really a good thing because that means the revenue per user for music streaming platforms is going to go down, which means artists will probably get paid less royalties as well. Mm. Yeah, man, with it, to me, what this is ringing as is the commoditization of content because there's so much of it. People are really going to get tired. They're not going to want to pay 50 different subscriptions to be segmented to 50 different niche, um, you know, subscribers, I mean, providers. So how can I co access my content in the same way tech companies? Well, no, not even tech companies. Let's look at um, networks, right? I mean, when I say mm -hmm. networks, I'm actually talking about phone networks. If you look at a company like AT&T, right? And, and those companies start bundling, right? Phone and internet. And then they want to integrate cable into those things. All, right, all these things, the bundling of those types of service and, and content and communication has always happened in some form of fashion as it started to grow. And there's, it really just comes back to competition, right? Like, how can we have as much market share of this stuff as possible? Because, okay, I have a cell phone and cell phones are awesome. But then if I realized that so a lot of the infrastructure, right? that I build because of my cell phone infrastructure and some of the, 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 um, the things that get provided also lend towards this internet thing, right? And, and then some of these other things like, well, yeah, because internet, like um, once we create the smartphone and you can access the internet through the phone, it was like now all of a sudden these things come together, right? So how can I control mo both of these things as opposed to leaving them separate and allowing somebody else to come in and take that market share? It's this never ending idea of how can I gobble up <laughs> communication and content All right, that's that's what it comes down um, to to me how do you see it well I, I'm admittedly I'm one of those people that you know Spotify comes with my phone to my phone contract so I don't pay for it directly wow. I didn't so, know people were they were doing that that's crazy yeah yeah it's quite a common thing here yeah because obviously I think well how the way I see it is that you know if I'm paying this X amount a month for this phone contract I'd actually be paying an extra £10 if I wasn't for Spotify. So actually I'm getting £10 off my phone per month is how mm, I see it. Yeah. But that's what they get you really, isn't it? Like, well, I may as well get it. I'm going to buy it anyway. So. Easy. Yeah. See, that's exactly where they, where, where <laughs> they get you because it comes down to leverage. Those bigger companies, they can take whatever those short-term losses are to create those bundles to make people see those benefits, like you said, gain market share from it and – it goes back to the fact that attention is the game, attention and data. If we have your attention and data, it doesn't matter if we're losing something, at least the competition doesn't have you, and we can figure out how to monetize you after that fact. This brings us also bringing back to like, the tech majors, like Amazon have uh, 
had a massive increase in their subscri subscribers for Amazon Prime Music. You know, it's yep. gone from like 18 million to 55 million in the past year. And that's primarily because a lot of people own, you know, Amazon Alexas and smart speakers in their homes. Mm -hmm. And they're offering like a, there's a free, there's a free Amazon Music plan that comes with them. So a lot of people, a lot more people are using the music services and then, you know, they pay for Prime, then they get music for free as well. They get some, some music for mm -hmm. free. So it's just adding on layer upon layer of subscription models. Exactly. That's how they to get to where they are now. That was funny because that was the first thing I heard when I heard that Amazon hit, hit 50 million users to their Amazon music. It's like, okay, they don't focus on pushing heavily, like marketing themselves and becoming these uh, this branded music platform like Spotify. We're the ones they were first yeah. and in terms of how they really push it and leveraged it. And then Apple comes in and they kind of have sexy brands that they, they push separately. Amazon doesn't seem to invest heavily in that. They recognize that music, listening to music is almost a utility at this point, right? Like it's, it's yeah. not, it's just a, a thing. It's not, it doesn't have to be sexy. So if we provide you this and we understand where customer behavior already is, you're already on the Alexa, right? You're already in these places. You don't necessarily want the whole you don't have to want to have to go over the behavioral change and the behavioral barriers of going through these other apps, right? Like what's going to be most integrated, what's going to be most convenient, what's going to work faster. And that goes back to, like I said, AT&T and all these other, or Comcast and all these other companies that'll bundle and take these other subsidiarities, us uh, areas so they can now infiltrate that business. Amazon is a platform that has the leverage to do just that, right? Like you said, the Prime, um, all the way down to like the grocery store delivery service. There's yeah, so we, many- We all use it, don't we, for something? Right, there's right. so many different integrations and aspects they're in. It's the ultimate lifestyle brand and they don't market themselves as it. That's what I love about it, right? You, you can think about hip hop was one of the huge innovators when it came to lifestyle brands, but it was also very much aspirational and we brand this world to you and amazon's world that they brand is a lot more about convenience and easy to access and then they just make it happen for you so next thing you know you're doing it because it's easy not oh it's so cool and i you know and, and yeah. there's so much power in that which also brings an inevitability to it in terms of the the the, the level of of presence that they'll have in that market that you can't necessarily escape. So I actually, after seeing the amount of energy they've put into this, because oh, prime, like you say, all these things become free. Their, their content, like the, 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 uh, the more Netflix competition style mm -hmm. of content that they have, the music platform, which I've never even tried Amazon music, but I don't have an Alexa yet. Right. Yeah. Um, it's been a very you know, quiet rise for them. They've been quietly right. getting about their business and all yeah. those things. They can happen quietly though, when you have control of the hardware and the platforms that people are already leveraging. And you might not even know that you're using that because you're just saying, let me hear some music. Right. Yeah. They've also, <laughs> they've also been like, very clever in the way they're positioned, like separating themselves from other streaming platforms. So for example, they've now got the high definition, like streaming option, the really, really high end one with like, with like Dolby Atmos and stuff. And you can pay, you know, an extra fee to get the, high, the HD streaming if you want to. But Spotify don't offer that. I know, I know it's hard or used to, or maybe they still do. So what's the difference when you say like the high definition? Like, does it like really just sound way better? Is that the only benefit or is there something else to it? It's mainly just sounds a lot better in it. And you can also, they've also done a partnership with Dolby for certain smart speakers so that it sounds even crisper, like, but, mm. um, so obviously Spotify still only offer 320 kilobytes per second as their high quality in inverted commas. But I think the HD is more like wave CD quality. Got you. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's an additional add on. I don't, I don't know how many consumers will truly care to the extent that they can't. But it's there the for the audio files. You but, see it's there, but it, they've got the extra layer that some haven't got. Therefore it gives them a slight edge in that small market. That's what it's all about though. Cause they're, yeah. they're also similar now. You've got to find that niche. That that was what I was gonna what I was gonna say though. Those music heads, those people who actually do care and can tell. That's always a market. So why not gobble up an additional <laughs> marketing? Yeah, exactly. Can? Yeah. <laughs>
So they, that's they're, interesting, they're, man. They're set to overtake Apple Music this year. Or they're on track to do that in terms of subscribers. How many is so, Apple Music at? I think it was, well, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure what the latest figures are. It's definitely, I think it's like 70 million or something. So not too far away. Yeah, so now. if they overcome Apple Music, when you think about the... So, uh, so 60 million, it surpassed uh, last year. So and Amazon are, in Amazon are like 55 million. Mm. Um, but the rate of growth, obviously, Amazon is a lot bigger curve than Apple. So... Yeah, I it's mean, not taking it seriously, you know, we haven't really, you know, we don't really talk about it a lot, but maybe it's going to become more of a main player, you know, this decade. It comes down to search, man. That's what it comes down to when, <clears throat> and that's where some, well, some of these platforms lose benefit where you have a platform like Amazon, right? We have all these, these uh, items. I was just looking at like camera bags and things like that before we hopped on this call and mm when I wanted to find something like now I go to Amazon just to search something in the same way I might Google it. It's weird. It's almost like, these, yeah. it's not, it's not weird. It's what Google already knows. These separate sites in, in their own way, they take away um, from search, right? And they're not direct search engines. That's not how they begin marketing themselves. Like Yahoo start, you know, with search engine being search engine forgot uh, mm. the one before uh, Google Netscape, I guess, I think, but Facebook is a search engine now. It started off as social media, but it's now a search yeah. engine. Amazon is a search engine for items, right? Like things that people shop for. But in that, it started to create this same um, ability when it comes from music. And then when you start to move towards this, the voice market of Alexa and was it Google Home? Is that what they call the Google one? No, that, that's the whole suite. Yeah, it's Google Home, I think, I think it is. Or the, okay. Yeah. yeah like just, all just to of, put in perspective that... A quarter of the U.S. population owns a smart speaker right now. A quarter. And, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. man. Yeah, and majority that. and majority of those are Amazon products. Like over sixty percent of those oh, Amazon course. products. So you think of the amount of people who are streaming who are now, you know, you have, so they're going to get they're going to have they're going to have access there to at least the free tier of Prime Music. There it so. is, right? So you make this stuff free, easily available, you know. And now all of a sudden when I'm in the a voice search space, it's wherever I am. What platform am I using already? I'm using Alexa. So essentially I'm on Amazon and I'm searching for everything through Amazon. Yeah. And if you is, say play this song, it's going to play it from Prime Music unless you say play it on, from Spotify. So therefore exactly. it's always got you like it's got, yeah, it's got you right where you want you. Yeah. It's, it's, that's it. So who's controlling the platforms? So that's, I, I'm really interested to see where Apple navigates in that particular side of things. So yeah, definitely. And also like that links quite nicely to the idea of, um, this, is, this is a point made by Mark Mulligan. He made the point about the tech majors becoming powerhouses. He also mentions that about we're currently experiencing a discovery crisis in that we're listening to way more music now, but at the same time, we're not really discovering as much. We're not really developing meaningful relationships with artists. Mm. We're sort of just streaming as a commodity just for, you know, just for a certain purpose rather than actually discovering new artists to love. And it could become a growing problem as the streaming culture increases. Now, what do you think? Do you think that's more of a feeling, you know, how just general, generationally some things change and they're not used to it and they say, oh, this isn't what it used to be. Or do you think there's some accuracy, accuracy to that? I think from, even though we look at it on the face of it, there's definitely, you know, there are stats to support this, but at the same time, I think we're shifting more towards the dark social now, which we'll talk about, you know, owning your own, owning your own fans and that. Therefore, I feel like people will switch away from this and become more community focused. And I still, I, I love like the Discover Weekly and Release Radar on Spotify, but at the same time, I'm not just, I'm not just in there just to save certain songs. I'm also then deep diving into the artist catalog as well. A lot of people aren't doing that. But I feel like we're going to lean more, we're going to go more towards like back to artist discovery rather than just listening to music. Just, right. Yeah. So let's walk through this. So essentially, they're kind of blaming playlisting culture. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And playlisting culture and radio culture. Which starts with the iPod, basically. Mm. Goes way back to the iPod, I'd argue. Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm 
and and because I'm listening to so much music through playlists, because I just want to, I go to a mood or something similar yeah, to this yeah. artist, and I'm not just listening to this artist at this time and this artist at this time. I'm I'm now hearing all these songs, and I get to know them maybe from frequency. I never might even know the artist that's actually singing this song, mm-hmm. yeah. right? In some way, though, I said, eh, all right, that's how it was with radio. I guess the biggest difference is the fact that at some point people were being upsold to choosing an artist, right? Which record do you want to go hear on demand? Yes, you can do that now, even easier, less of a barrier to entry because there's no no CDs that you have to go buy. You can just actually go to that artist. But I guess maybe it's almost so accessible that people don't use it now. I, you know, like I, maybe the incentive isn't there. Is, well, is that what's way. driving it? Is that what he's saying? I don't understand. I think at this point that on that side, you know, we have got all these playlists and it is very easy to listen to music and listen to artists and not really think about them or, you know, just listen to whatever comes on. But at the same time, because of social media and things like Bandcamp, you know, you can be a lot closer to actually than they helped you before. Therefore, in that way, you are really building meaningful relationships with artists. Well, I guess where I lean to is the idea that it's probably some sense of an exaggeration just because the landscape has changed. And what I mean by that is you can really look at the whole concept of an, a long tail, right? At one point, attention was concentrated on a small segment of the market because attention couldn't even be accessed for a lot of the niches out there or niches, however you say that word, right? Like that just wasn't possible. Internet happens, bam, eventually people can now consume a lot of these smaller communities and types of music genres and all that stuff. More people can access them and those genres can access more people. So what happens is that attention that was monopolized in on the short side of, of the long tail, all of a sudden has to be shared. And when that happens, especially when you include social media, it's not that there are no closer relationships, I feel like. I feel like they're just less stars on steroids where we have these people that were up here and now it's increased a middle class. There used to be a huge attention gap, right? The inequality attention gap now that gap is shrunk, right? You have more people from the bottom that is, have risen to the middle, but you have some of those people who are at the bottom of the top that have, have came down a little bit. You have the super superstars that are still there, but now there's a lot of people that I believe in the 90s, the 80s, right? That were looked at on a certain level that yeah. would not have been perceived on that level, right? Today, because not because of a talent, I'm not even just saying that, because a lot of times people think, that oh there's less talent no there's no way there's less talent it's more today, competition now right it's That's, more competition yeah. and we have more access to bad talent yeah, there's exactly. less curation yeah. right so i think some of that has to do with the fan relationship as well it's like yes we do have our deep connection still with certain people but then there's also more uh bad quality connections you, yeah you there'll, there'll, there'll always be super fans but they'll just be a more constrained amount for different artists whereas exactly. like whereas like, yeah exactly yep. so that's where I, that's where i see it going i don't think it is necessarily a crisis i think it's just it is now part of the culture but there will still always be you know the, a place for the you know the, the tight-knit community to build relationships with the artists like, cause we've it's got a crisis the, like, for those who are invested in the old model but philosophically you can argue like <laughs> you can argue for the new way Right. If you want to think of a more, uh, let's say, socialism or just what do you call it? Merit of of talent that like that type of philosophy and about the people and the people being control. That, that's mm-hmm. more today. If you're thinking about capitalism. Right. And control. Then and, and your specific purist critique of what quality is, then that might lend towards the old model. And that brings us on to his other point about fandom becoming the new currency. Mm. And this is now this is the you know, this is the power of technology now that we have got to this point where you can directly reach out and support your artists. If I like this particular artist, you know, 
not only do I not only do I just go to their gig or buy their merch, I can now, at least in Eastern culture and Eastern music, I can actually, you know, tip artists, play out a certain track or just, you know, just support them, just, you know, give them a bit of money if I want to directly. Right. And this is what he now believes we're now steering to this in the West over the course of the next decade. And we're starting to see that being implemented with um, platforms like Loom, we mentioned last time, they've launched their new virtual currency called Notes, where you can directly tip artists that you like on the platform. And we are seeing Twitter are now starting to experiment with it as well. They might be implementing it into the platform this year, which is, you know, the biggest change that's happened to Twitter in a long time, really. And YouTube has already did that as well. Yeah. yeah Twitch has chats. been doing yeah. that for a long time. I think, man, that's just a matter of time. It's inevitable. I never really understood why they hadn't done that before because it seems just, and you know, from my perspective, it's a great ability to access another form of profit for a company because so many times our, for our technology platforms, let's look at social media because this is where a large part of it comes from. All right. Social media will, you know, it grew, it expanded. And then so many of these platforms look to hit a certain threshold of having market share. And now we're going to monetize through advertising. And then mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, for some people, a lot of people that ruins the user experience, blah, 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 blah. At least that's what they say. The other model, and, and a lot of these companies, by the way, still are not profitable. Although you have this advertising yeah. and you're making hundreds of millions, but at the same time, you're still not profitable due to all expenses. And the other model is like, yo, we're just starting out and we have this ingrained way of making money that the, the community actually likes because we're taking a share of the tipping Spotify, not Spotify, TikTok. I believe they take 50%. I'm not aware how I much. Do, yeah. 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 I'm not aware how much everybody takes, but that's, profit have it as opposed to having to wait the fact that you have revenue that's already starting before you even think about advertisers and obviously tiktok is very smart in how they're integrating advertisers but even getting into t traditional programmatic advertising and things like that just the ability to have your own revenue stream it only makes sense that um, without having to wait for those other things and and even the stickers, right? They've been doing that in, like you said, Eastern yeah. culture for so yeah. long. Even I remember when I first realized that, cause I could even, when Facebook tried that years ago, cause then that's probably part of it. They haven't trained people in America, at least their behavior to do stuff like that. Cause to me, I'm like, why yeah. would somebody buy a, a sticker? Like what, 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 do, what do they get from the sticker? I still don't understand that completely yeah. more yeah. than I used to. But when it first started, that's probably had to be like, I feel like I might've been in high school, maybe in college but I just remember that feature and I didn't understand what was the point, even when it's free. Like I didn't, I don't understand poke. I never understood like, why, why do I want to poke somebody? I don't, I don't understand that stuff, but there's a culture that does those things fanatically. And then the, and then the fact that there's money behind it is, it just seems like it's the only way to go. If, if not only for the fact that, platforms like TikTok are coming over and these other platforms which help train us users to do so but if you don't there the competitive advantage of that act, act of additional stream of income alone becomes a threat to your company being able to to even you know withstand these other companies yeah i think, I think the reason why companies in the past maybe pushed back and didn't implement it was because they are the gatekeepers and i think they might have seen a sense of potentially losing a bit of control if you start giving the user too much power to influence the way the, you know, the platforms run and i think that's what it mainly came down to i think there's a lot of there's a lot of fear factor in giving too much too early that's so it's so funny you said that that's because that's weird to me when it's like are these U u.s platforms are based off of a democratic philosophy, right? Yeah, yeah. And TikTok is very much so not that as far as how they really push it. It's central control and they're not really, mm -hmm. you know, shy about it. But at the same time, when you think about the power of the user, right? And the community itself, it actually is kind of what you said. It's like, okay, this is the, supposed to be the democratic way of thinking. However, we're doing things like that that might limit the empowerment of individual users while TikTok or 
these Eastern platforms, as as you uh, alluded to, they do a lot of things that really do empower uh, uh, the users and the individuals who are on that platform to thrive off of income. And I know that that, that can go to a far deeper argument, but it's just funny. A lot of the the nuances back and forth that you can spot and the contradictions on on both ends that come yeah. from yeah. Because if anything, maybe they just maybe they feared that if they gave me these features, they'd then get enough money and would then move away from the platform and launch their own, you know, their own network or company. Whereas in fact, mm. it, that would actually keep them on the platform. They didn't realize it at the time. Mm. Maybe they were just yeah. That's one way of looking at it potentially. True. True. Yeah. Because I, I actually always have wondered why somebody, right, didn't create their own app. Like why didn't Kanye, I remember thinking this when Kanye was asking for money um, so much, like, why doesn't Kanye at least have some standalone app, even if it doesn't make all the money he wants, right, or needs with whatever he was trying to raise it, why doesn't he have his own standalone app that you can subscribe to and get whatever, right, or stream him individually and or get a lot of his side material Mm, him okay artist super perfectionist so it might be hard for him to have a certain prevalence of of content and product but still the theory and the concept still lies like why aren't there more stars that do that on a higher level there have been some on yeah, you, did you read Trapital's article on jay-z for example you know who his projects and all his partnerships like launching an album exclusively on like a particular was it a particular like nokia phone like in oh I remember he did the uh, Samsung one. I didn't know he did something. Yeah, I mean, but it, was, it might have been Nokia, it might have been Sony Ericsson or something, but he did launch there was a, 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 an actual special limited edition phone came out with it as well. It's like a Jay Z like phone. Ah, uh, see, like, no, and, and that's see, that's a whole conversation about Jay Z because I'm thinking about somebody having their own isolated thing that they're completely in control of all the data and everything, but. When it comes that's to what Jay-Z. he's done now, isn't he? He has taken, you know, he's bought his own company. He has learned from this experience. And he's Tidal, now owning his yes. own brand. Yeah. Title yeah. is that. So Tidal he had to go that. through that process of, you know, selling the brand away to others to then realize that the power is in his own hands. And, and that's what Jay Z does, though. I don't think it's just about realizing the power. I think he's always had has always had a sense of power being in his own hands. Yeah, I think that's but true. But yeah. Jay Z has used partnership to learn, mm-hmm. right? Which lowers the risk of starting anew every single time when you tap into all these different industries. So instead of building my own fat platform from scratch, let me leverage, go to a platform. Oftentimes the person who's not perceived as the leading in the market. So then they even could le- use, you know, my brand even more. There's more meaning to my brand and impact for their individual brand in between it. And I learn from that relationship. And then I decide, do I want to move on? And eh, no, mm-hmm. I don't like this business. You know, but I, I learned and I got a lot from it. I might, I don't want to be in it, at least not right now. Maybe I'll double back in years, but I, I minimize right my risk. Bam, I get out. Or do I say, hmm, I really like this shit. And then I just buy out the rest of the company, yeah. right? There's, he's definitely leveraged partnership extremely um, smartly. And I think a lot of people can learn from that, especially from somebody who, you know, he didn't go to college. So I think mm-hmm. in, in a lot of his approach is, hey, and, and that's super irrelevant at this point anyway, when you think about go to college, but he still has that mentality of, I need to learn from somebody and I can learn from somebody in situations. He puts himself in situations where he can get around people who are sharp at what they do, learn and decide if he continues in that business model or not, which is super smart. Absolutely, yeah. I'll make sure to link Dan's article in, in the description because it's quite a good breakdown of timeline of sort of like his projects Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Days, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interviewing Dan in a couple of hours, by the way. Oh, sweet. Great. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Well, check out Trapital, honestly. There's so many, many, many great articles on there. 100%. And that moves us. I just want to come back to the tipping about Twitter. Like, do you think this could, you know, revive it somewhat for, you know, independent artists, musicians? Like, has it got some more life in it yet for them to utilize from a marketing perspective now? I don't see it. I just okay. too late. Yes, well, t- Twitter has its place, right? And yeah. I think they have a stronghold on their place in the marketplace. But tipping in itself, especially because like all these other platforms are starting to do it, 
it's just going to be a standard. So if everybody's doing it, it's not like it's going to say, hey, Twitter other, all of a sudden is allowing artists to do this. Let's go there. I mean, even Spotify is considering something like that, yeah. right? So yeah, that, that, that won't be the thing. I suppose Twitter does opinion. have its virality still, though, doesn't it? Does it can you know, things can shoot off very quickly on Twitter, like in terms of going viral, which could lead to more tipping than other platforms would. I, I think there's a lot of benefit like, mm. from tipping, but I just don't think that will be the value add. And it, no. I'm I'm more about the Amazon way of doing things when we're talking about, especially businesses needing to reinvent themselves or find their way back. Yeah. Right, you can't leverage cool features, things that sound great, and expect behavior to change. You have to do things that are in line with behavior, like Amazon saying, "Hey, we have the hardware. We create this thing where you all go to." It's almost it's an indirect move, but now because of this, we're bringing you to our other place. All right, they yeah. might ne- ever have the brand value in terms of being a music streaming platform. They might not ever have that, but they can still have the sheer numbers where it doesn't mm-hmm. matter, where they're profiting and they're in that business just as much as anybody, but they they just don't have the, oh yeah, Spotify is the number one and and you know they, they might not have that. The, or the warts and and like they that because that's not their core business necessarily. So you don't need that to be playing in the game. And you don't have to have the sexy business model to even make be the most profitable. Yeah, so maybe Twitter is not still not the one like it's, you know, it's trying different things, but it's ultimately playing catch up and doing not really, you know, as you say, not really inventing anything new and yeah. exciting. What what can Twitter do? I, I wonder because. Well, they can listen to the community yeah. first of all and add an edit button. That might be a start. Edit is it add an edit button? button? Yeah, because obviously that's the most like oh, yeah. community <laughs> feature ever. Yeah. And they're never going to listen. They never listen to them. Like, yes. you know, trying oh my to. God. You know, trying to appease your consumers, it's not a really good way to go about it. Because I think the CEO announced this week when he talked about the new features that that's never in their plans. It's not going to happen. It's not in I there. wonder what that is about. I, I guess there is, I don't know. Maybe is there like just, a stance on seeing themselves as news? Because right? that's yeah, what I feel like they push yeah. themselves as news. So you have I to there is that, I guess there is a danger if something does go viral and then someone can completely change the content of that tweet to something a lot more like malicious or potentially dangerous. Then huh. there is there is that aspect to it. Okay. You could say the same with all the platforms though, because obviously you can edit on all other platforms. Yeah. So the same thing could happen. I don't know whether that's just been I don't know whether that's a thinking or not, I'm not sure. Like Yeah, I mean screenshots allow things. I don't yeah, yeah. I wonder, we'll have to look more into that. Yeah, that's, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, that, that is something different, but I don't think I admire it. I think it's for the wrong reasons. It's just them <laughs> being stubborn, isn't it, really? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I would really love to see what they could get themselves into because it would definitely have to be more of a indirect thing. And Twitter is just a light. It's, it's, it's a lot, part of life. It's not going to be that thing, right? But they can create something else that's that thing and Twitter get reintroduced to that thing. And, and then things, you know, flourish in, in mm-hmm. that way. I think that's what they should be more focused on, but that's just, you know, how that's a very macro perspective of it, but whatever the micro things that they're working on day to day and innovations, I haven't really checked up on Twitter in a, in a long time. Another interesting article that we've read recently uh, is about the headline is our podcast threatening the growth of the music industry. This was a Rolling Stone article, and obviously, it's a very strong opinionative statement. Um, it yeah. certainly caught my attention because I wasn't. It's not something I've ever really thought about because yeah. I feel like it's a di- completely different area. Even though we're talking about audio, I know Spotify is very heavily invested, but also the headline's a bit misleading because the market share has only sw- only flipped by like five percent since 2014. So it's gone from gone down from uh, it was 20% before and now music share music share has gone down to 76% so that's a 5% decrease for music in favor and a 20% gain for podcasts mm. so 5% decrease for music and 20% gain for podcasts in terms of market share 
Yeah. That's, that's not too much. I don't, I don't think it's just too. It's not really too much to shout about. I don't think. Like obviously, podcasts have been getting increasingly popular in the last five years. Yeah, I mean, so. you see that in stats all the time. Something could be the fastest growing, but it's still a very low percent. But just yeah. the perception of that general statement can make it seem larger than it is. But I think there's a lot of merit to that statement, if not for now but what could possibly be looked at in the future only because if you look at some of the information, I think they might've actually quoted Daniel Eck. Um, but mm. if they, if they didn't quote him, the the founder, it was somebody who said it in, within the company, just citing the fact that spot podcasts were a fixed cost. And we know the issues that it comes with dealing with record labels, right? Yes. There's more music yeah. and yes, there, the entertainment value and just the looping and the that form of entertainment it brings a, a larger market in its own way for sure. But at the same time, having to do with variable costs, especially for a company that is always searching for profitability and wasn't profitable for years, technically, are they even profitable now? I, I can't remember. Just about. Yeah. Just about. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. so like when you're talking about as a business, and then you look at the fact that there actually are new competitions that actually um, are formidable. Finally, when we look at somebody like TikTok, like the things that TikTok is doing is a is a legitimate threat right yeah, now. 100%. I'm not saying that they're going to take over tomorrow, but they are a very legitimate threat. And just innovation wise, because of they because of the lack of politics and the things and and the and the way they came into the game, they were able to innovate way far past what Spotify has done for a good period because yeah. Spotify has had so much market share. So to hedge some of that bet and say, hey, yeah, we're number one in music right now, specifically when we think about streaming only platforms, which now like at one at one point that won't really matter streaming only platform no because we're looking at bundles and everything being bundled together so that's less relevant at, at some point you have to think about the fact that if we can improve our profitability by focusing on podcasts and we know that tiktok isn't going to look at podcasts right yeah, that's yeah. that's too far outside of mm -hmm. the circle of competence and, and where their focus is so it allows us to hedge our, our bet in that way so I think there's a lot of credence to why we would look at um, podcasts from a Spotify standpoint. Again, one, just summarizing as fixed costs and the profitability that could come from that. And two, just fighting off the uh, opposing threats. They're also reported in the, uh, it's a trend that's happening across all ages for podcasts, especially like in 13 to 34 year olds. I said that, it was in 2012, it was 88% music consumption, 12% listening to podcasts. But now it's switched, shifted to 81% and 19%. So there's been a 7% shift, which I guess is, is, is I mean, when you, when you factor that into hours and minutes, that's quite a significant jump. Yeah. The past seven years. That, that is, uh, yeah, you're right. Because kind of like you said, I mean, pod podcasts are, are longer generally speaking all right and yeah. then two so that's more time that the time might be a lot closer time listening music versus time on a podcast yeah that, this is a point this would be interesting to see wouldn't it yeah right so then we even think about that from the fixed cost of podcast maybe getting even deeper and saying hey we not only have this fixed cost but then you get into the 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 fact that time is spent more time or maybe an equal amount of time is running ads as well running ads for, right yeah. so the amount of attention is still equal it looks different on the surface oh i'm losing here but at the end of the day you're we're talking about economics not the optics right so so now now we are getting into the threat really I, we are yeah, doing, yeah. 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 like I, I think that I, that could be something. Of course, we have to spend time, more time looking at that. And I would love to keep talking about this and um, step to date to, the, to this one specifically. But yeah, I'm, podcasts are definitely going to continue growing in my mind just because that radio thing is not, it's not something that people don't desire. It's just the, what's the word I'm looking for? The format 
that is mm. dwindled down, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean that people don't like listening to talk shows or conversations. People love conversations. The, the most profitable parts of radio are typically those morning shows. And it's usually where they put the bigger personalities, right? And those bigger personalities matter because of the conversations they bring, the interest they bring. It's almost, it's, it's based, built off stars in their own right, right? Yeah. That's the most profitable part of radio. The rest of it is just, I'm, I don't even want to say just the most, the most profitable part because, yeah, I don't, I'm not super in deep with, uh, you know, the, the, the radio balance sheets, but that's definitely one of the most adored and, and the highest paid people, the h- highest highest paid host are the yeah, most people yeah. those, right? For sure. So, and which indicates profitability though, it, it usually alludes towards. So my thing is that means if I'm listening to this morning show more for the morning show, the people than the music in the first place, if the next generation comes, they're not going to not want to listen to people they, they like talking and conversations that they like. They're going to still desire that it's just this medium. This medium doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I don't like having to sit through commercials. I don't like not being able to listen on demand when I want to. The consumer behavior has changed, but the desire for the product definitely hasn't. So I could see podcasts, you know, growing. Yeah, and bring it to a more micro le- micro level for like you guys. If you're considering like uh, launching your own podcast, then I definitely think it would be worthwhile. It would just be good to focus on something outside of your music, saying you know that's more of a niche, more about you, more of your personality. And Perfect time to, to 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 remember that music news that matters is streaming on all platforms. One hundred percent. Yeah, we're finally doing it. Yeah, we're, see, we're we're doing it. There's no reason why you guys can't as well. But it's just finding something to talk about that you're passionate about not necessarily like ties into the music that can come later. It's just about, mm. you know, just showing who you are essentially. True. What? I mean, maybe we don't talk about it enough really. We talk about, you know, advice, you know, what you can do to promote your music and what you can do on social media, but maybe a podcast should have more of like a shine, a light shine to it as it were. You think so? I think so. I think, I think it's good. If we're talking about, you know, building up your personality on social media this is another great way to do it. And you can talk about something perhaps you wouldn't necessarily talk about on social media. Like if you're a singer songwriter, but you're really into like, like mythical creatures or something, and then you, know, <laughs> you can start a podcast on that. Like, you know, and it's, there's going to be an audience for it. And then they buy into you as a person, then they might go and check out the rest of it. And this is how it leads to super fans. And then this is how it leads back to tipping and stickers and all that. Yeah, I think that's so. a great point, man, because if we want to get any indication of super fans, a large, pro- a good indicator probably is time spent. And if you have 50 people listening to your podcast religiously, that's probably a lot better than maybe even a thousand just listeners. Yeah, exactly. Know? Yeah. They're the, one, they're the ones that are going to sustain you and support you in your careers, the super fans, not, not the general listeners. Like, yeah. Like listeners to your music. So yeah, podcasts probably, are are far stronger pla- indications of that so that could be a good way to start sifting through and seeing who that is and that's my issue with the monthly listeners stat on spotify i don't think it's a very good aggregator or really good indicator for a nice performance <laughs> tell me about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and also i've always wondered as well i'm not sure why a lot of artists have quite low low follow accounts on spotify I don't know why people don't follow artists on Spotify like they would like they would on social media because I like to follow them so I get notified when they've got a new song out if I like them. But even big artists don't have a lot of followers. I've always wondered why people don't follow artists on Spotify. The platform doesn't lend towards it, man. Uh, uh, it's right. It's right there. It's right there on the artist page that she followed. Like it's just at the top. Like. But there, there are always these innate behaviors that come from each platform. That's why you'll say something like a million followers on YouTube is way more powerful than a million followers on Instagram, right? Yeah. And shoot, a million followers on SoundCloud or Spotify is, is more powerful than a million followers on YouTube because it's like, who has a million followers on, on Spotify? You know what I mean? Mm. So because the platforms and the way con- you know typical user behaviors are, and I think when it comes to spotify the user behavior that gets encouraged is a lot more of that playlisting all right 
that behavior. Playlists have bigger followings than a lot of artists, right? It's more about yeah. that culture that gets established there than building up individual stars of, uh, yeah, individual stars, individual artists, just like when you think about TikTok, right? Following on a page is, is different. And when you hear music and you see a TikTok, you're most people's behavior right now is to hear the music and then go find the music. It does, it's not, hey, this is the song on the platform. Let me go find where the original sound is or let me go see if that artist's page is on TikTok and follow them on TikTok. It's like, no, let me go off the platform and go listen to the song. You don't even, so you, you can have a million streams on, on um, I mean, a million views on a TikTok video and your sound is just popping, but your profile still has, a thousand followers right it's it's an interesting aspect but yeah each platform has their own innate behavior and then my question for you would be well i was going to counter that as well because i I think with spotify you're saying that it's not in the culture to follow artists per se it's not but but by following an artist you do get notified you know when their new songs come out okay and then then we have when we have spotify now implementing pop-up alerts telling you when artists have got new songs coming out Mm-hmm. That seems to be exactly the same model. It, it's, it's the same. What's the same model? It's, it's literally, you know, that pop-up alert notifies you when one of your artists you like has got new, a new song out. Mm-hmm. And by following them, it does exactly the same function. So they clearly, they clearly find some value in that and they're going to sell that to the labels to, you know, buy adverts. So right. maybe they are bringing that into their culture. Well, know, like, or maybe... Because that's that was going to be my question to you. Is there still value to it? Yes, you basically just answered that then. Um, but then from a company standpoint, is there more value for uh, in us encouraging that behavior so it happens without us or us being in control of that happening, right? You could have encourage people to follow and now these people just naturally follow and get notifications or I can just sell it as a revenue stream. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it's against the company's incentive, right? There's, you know, that that was, I, I wonder why, well, no, I haven't wondered why that specifically um, ha- happens with Spotify, but I think that's a really interesting take because yeah, I have yeah, noticed that before. Yeah, it's probably really interesting from a consumer standpoint. Like, so I follow an artist because I want to keep track of when they release new songs, and that's the best way for me to do that. I don't follow anybody. That's, I that's never follow enough. anybody. It's, it's interesting. It's a different, completely different interaction with the platform, isn't it? Yeah. But in that, but in that's I'm the common man. You, you're, you are, <laughs> you're, you're something special when it comes to that, though. I don't know though because there's quite a lot. There's still a lot of followers for a lot of artists. I'm not sure. I have a debate in the comments section about. There this. are, and there might be. There's probably some artists that have more, far more followers than others, and not because they're these larger artists, but maybe they have a different relationship with their fan base. Maybe they encourage it. And that's I, why I think these stats are more important than the monthly listeners. That was what exactly. that goes back to my original point. But yeah, yeah. Yes. So I, I I wonder like what that is, and I I would question what a, when I when I see something like that where you say this is valuable, but it's not prevalent on the platform as it is, and especially when you're saying this is valuable to the core consumer of the platform, yet they're not doing it, then I would question one, the company's business model, and two, the the quality of the of the product based on and maybe that's just a different indicator of what success looks like on a product that is but i would i wonder i would love to know what anybody who's listening thinks about followers on spotify and then are there any artists out there who have heavily encouraged followers and seen a gain from it maybe we can interview yes artists yeah. at some point who has a hell of a lot of followers and see what that culture looks like what they do around it yes please debate and discuss i think that's a great place to end it there really i think sean i agree yeah well, well, thanks for tuning in, guys, as always. And make sure you check it out on all the audio streaming platforms now. We're finally on podcast format. Yes, yes, once again. And don't forget to hit that notification bell. Have a great one, everybody. Peace. Bye. It's the network.